Hey everybody, it's Allison Harrell with the Fort Bend Museum, and today I have for you the story of Pittsville. Now, before I begin and jump right in, you might hear some extra noises in the background of today's video. That's because I've moved inside of the Moore home to film this video, and I will explain why when we get to that part in the video, but um, the Moore home is getting a little bit of renovation done right now. So what you are hearing is actually people on the roof. So just disregard any and all banging and let's jump right into it. Austin's first 300 colonists that settled within Fort Bend County were mostly self-sufficient. They pretty much built farms and plantations that created everything they needed to live within their own farmer plantation. There were very few exceptions to this, like Knight and White Store or San Felipe, but over time, with more people moving to the area, more areas of industry were needed, so additional towns started popping up. Pittsville was one of these towns. Pittsville was located 17 miles northwest of Richmond and was really a place that the people who didn't want to deal with the dangers of the Brazos River bottom ended up settling. Now, by dangers, I mean things like disease and flooding. By moving farther away from the riverbed, they were able to sort of avoid mosquito-borne illnesses and also frequent flooding. So it was kind of a win-win. Now, this area um, was pretty small, but let's talk a little bit about what it had within it. So pretty immediately after Texas gains its independence, Pittsville gains a Methodist church. So um, after Texas became independent, the citizens of the area didn't have to keep pretending that they were Catholic. So by 1837, there was a Methodist mission established in Pittsville. The preacher was paid in cows because they were pretty cash poor, but resource wealthy. And within two years, the Un Union Chapel Methodist Church at Pittsville was founded. So they had a church. Uh, pretty quickly, they also had a few other businesses. They had a few stores. They had a photography studio, a post office. And the post office was actually run by the same family that ran one of those stores, the Pitts family. And so the town itself was named after the citizens, which makes perfect sense. Now, by 1860, Pittsville was one of the five post offices in Fort Bend County. So they sort of spread the post offices across the county, and you just had to travel to the closest one to you in order to get your mail. So for a lot of people that didn't want to live near Richmond, Pittsville was a great alternative. With a bustling community that was spread pretty far from the county center, you would expect that a railroad would reach out and ask if they wanted to connect in with a rail line and connect to the rest of the county. So the Buffalo Bayou, Brazos, and Colorado Railway did reach out to Pittsville, and they actually planned on building a line out there. Unfortunately, the Civil War sort of put the kibosh on that plan. So once the Civil War started, no one was building tracks, and then afterwards, the entire railroad's plan changed. Now, another railroad did reach out. It was the Texas Western Narrow Gauge Railroad. They did actually service to Pittsville. They connected to um, an area pretty close by, but they only had 57 miles of track. So while there was a railroad, it was a unique one. It wasn't universally accepted because it was a narrow gauge, which meant it didn't interconnect with the other railroads. Railroads are complicated, but just know they did connect in with a narrow gauge. Now, in 1880, a new railroad came to them. This was the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railroad. They came to the citizens of Pittsville in 1880 and said, hey, we would love to build a railroad right through your area. And the citizens who owned the particular land in question looked them straight in the face and said no. Let's talk a little bit about that railroad now. So let's talk about the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railroad. It was chartered on August 28, 1884, and its goal was to connect San Antonio to another deep water port that wasn't Galveston. If you've watched any of our other railroad videos, you will know that right of way to deep water ports was a massive issue with railroads, and not a single city in Texas was exempt from this frustration, including San Antonio. So, this railroad's goal was to connect to another deep water port. Unfortunately, there wasn't one yet. So their goal was to connect to a coastal town that they could then create a deep water port at. 
So the first mile of track was laid by Uriah Lott and other railroad officials. And this was a really just a PR stunt done to garner both publicity and funding because all railroads suffered from those two detractors. And then the next four miles came from a San Antonio streetcar company. The next 10 miles of track were acquired from the Pennsylvania Steel Company. And then Floresville was reached in 1886. This was 30 miles away, and at that point, every single ounce of enthusiasm about this railroad died. No one cared. So Uriah Lott, the head of the railroad, went to Mifflin Kennedy. He was a pretty prominent figure in Corpus Christi, and Uriah Lott got Mifflin to fund the railroad's track all the way to Corpus Christi. So they managed to reach Corpus Christi by 1887 and their ultimate goal of Aransas Pass in 1889. So it was after the railroad reached Aransas Pass that they started working on making Aransas Pass into a deep water port, but um, they also started working on expanding the railroad in other directions. So the railroad reached Kerrville, which was north from where they started. They reached Houston, Houston via Yoakum in 1888. And Yoakum was a railroad created town where all the repair facilities were located. So Yoakum was a pretty important stop on any railroad in Texas. Okay, so we know that the city of Pittsville said no. We know a little bit about the railroad. Let's find out about what happens next. So after the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railroad was turned down by the two landowners that had the land they wanted within Pittsville, they started shopping around to other landowners. And eventually, someone said yes. And that someone was Churchill Fulcher Jr. This man right here. So let's talk a little bit about the Fulcher family. So Churchill Fulcher Sr. was one of Austin's old 300. He brought his family from Tennessee to Texas in 1824, and then in 1831, he died. So everything was passed on to his son, Churchill Fulcher Jr., who luckily for him in 1830 had married Minerva Cartwright Fulcher. So we have this lovely couple, they have five children, and by the 1850s, they're one of the well-known families in Fort Bend County. They raise cotton, and they're just wealthy landowners, but they also have a sideline. So the sideline that this family operated, besides cotton and just being wealthy and owning land, was actually horse racing. So from 1850 to 1870, Churchill Fulcher Jr. owned and operated what he called Churchill Downs. Not the one in Kentucky, it was here in Texas. However, this was a very successful horse racing track. Now, if you've ever been to the city of Fulcher and you've poked around a bit or you grew up there, you will know that there's an elementary school there named Huggins. Now, that is very important for me to point out to you because the Huggins family, one of the family members was John Huggins and he was the horse trainer for Churchill Fulcher Jr. They say that John Huggins could forget more about horses in a single day than most people learned in a lifetime. He was incredibly good at his craft, and it's said that he might have gone on to train a Triple Crown winner. So not only was he just really good at it, so were the horses that he trained. So, pretty decent sideline. Now, after the railroad was built through Fulcher's land in 1888, this was after the heyday of the horse racing track. So Churchill Fulcher Jr. was getting older and he just sort of was like, sure, build a railroad track. Now, this railroad ended up being a massive boon to him financially. And that's because it was so much easier to get goods to market. So this immediate distribution of goods was such a helpful asset for a landowner to have. Now, most of the citizens of Pittsville kind of realized the same thing. So they had been taking advantage of the narrow gauge train line that was put through their area. But unfortunately for them, that narrow gauge train line was abandoned in 1896. So suddenly they didn't have access to any trains. They could have had two train lines, they stuck with just the one, and then the one went under and now they have no train lines. 
So by 1890, many citizens from Pittsville had actually already moved over to Fulcher's land to create the newly named town of Fulcher. Now, this town is still in existence today. The town itself is still pretty small, but a lot of people are now moving out there. And I think it's really important that you remember where your town is named from. And the fact that your town could have been named Pittsville, which is kind of the worst, but named after the Pitts family, so I guess it does make sense. Now, to wrap up this entire story, we know that the town of Pittsville is no more. The town of Fulcher has fully eclipsed it. If you are curious and would like to see what remains of Pittsville, there is actually a historical marker there. Um, I'll put the map on the screen so you can see where to go to read a little bit more about the city of Pittsville. So disaster struck the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railroad on January 2nd, 1890. That was when one of the wooden bridges they had built over the Lavaca River collapsed. And this put the company in a really tricky situation because when the bridge collapsed, there was a train on it. <laughs> and the train, the cargo, and all the people on board were all lost, which meant that suddenly the company had many debts they needed to pay. Now, the weakness of the San Antonio and Aransas Pass Railway was their track. They often laid their track without any ballast, so they weren't adding extra rocks in order to keep everything straight. And this meant that it was susceptible to weather and to heat. And if you've ever been to Texas, you know we have heat in spades. So they also often built wooden bridges, which were perilous and, as previously shown, can collapse. So the company went into receivership later that year. It had 688 miles of track and 50 locomotives. Now, the company was purchased and reorganized without its charismatic founder, Uriah Lott, by Southern Pacific, which it turns out was super illegal. And so that deal was nullified and a third party had to take over. But eventually the rules were changed and in 1824, Southern Pacific did officially take over that track. Um, at that time, they were about to hit their peak of mileage for that railroad. And that year was 1827 when they hit 859 miles of track. Now today, the specific track that went through Fulcher no longer exists. They've taken the track out. It's not even an abandoned railroad. It's not even a land feature at this point. But I do find it very fascinating that um, that's how that town was made and built and they no longer have the railroad, but they did keep the name and the location. Thank you for joining us today. Hope to see you next time. Bye.